and my friend who was um, a co-dance captain with me was talking about it. He said, are you going to work on the Spider-Man show? And I said, the what? It was a powerful property. The, you know, the eyes of the world were upon the Spider-Man. And it seemed like it was constant drama from that jump off point. It hasn't even opened yet, but there has been another accident for the most expensive Broadway musical ever. From the creator of Politics Weekly. Not only can the actors get hurt, but the audience can get hurt. You know, a death might occur right in front of you. Does whatever a spider can, the story of the Spider-Man musical. Featuring a special appearance from Ben Brantley. Now available wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey everyone, welcome to Politics Weekly. Politics Weekly is a weekly nonpartisan podcast featuring some of the biggest names in politics and portraying some of the biggest political stories of the week through both left and right leaning lenses. Hosted by award winning journalist Nolan Cleary, the e- former editor in chief of the Hudsonian newspaper, Politics Weekly has been listened to by over 15,000 people worldwide. The views expressed by guests on our show are not necessarily the views expressed by the host, Nolan Cleary. All right. Welcome back to Politics Weekly. My my name is Nolan Cleary. I'm your host as always. And today we have a very special guest. She is a foreign policy expert, Patricia DiGennaro. Hi, thanks for having me. So, Patricia, as a foreign policy expert, what are some of the things that you see in the world that concern you the most today? What concerns me the most today is the United States of America, actually and our inability to get along right now on Capitol Hill, mostly, have a vision for the future and where we'd like to be and how we'd like to present ourselves in the world. I think right now we're still living in a policy kind of environment that has been the same since the Cold War. And it's really time that our our legislative and congressional leaders and our president get together and map out a better vision for the U.S. in the future. We have some very, very large issues that are global issues. We need to understand how to start tackling them and getting the best people in place. Things like climate change, pandemics. We all went through the pandemic. It's probably won't be the last one. So these are kinds of the large scale issues that we need to start tackling and we can't do it alone. We have to understand how to work with others, including China, Russia, and Iran, the people that we call most adversarial to us, right? All right. Well, with that being said, let's get into the news stories of the week. So the first news story of the week, former President Donald Trump has been indicted for a second time. This is over Trump's handling of classified documents that he brought to Mar-a-Lago after leaving the White House. Some, many Republicans that are running against Donald Trump in the 2024 primary have kind of expressed mixed feelings about this. Vivek Ramswamy, one of the candidates that is running against Trump as a Republican, has condemned the indictment of Donald Trump He called it political and has pledged to pardon Trump if he is elected to the White House. Other Republican candidates, such as former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, have condemned Trump and have said that this would not have happened if Trump had given the documents when he was originally subpoenaed. A few months ago, when he was first indicted, President Trump became the first president in United States history to be federally indicted. Now he has been indicted twice. Trump has said that if he is convicted and goes to prison before the 2024 election, he will not drop out of the race. What are your thoughts on Trump being indicted for the second time? 
Well, I hope this time it goes through. You know, this is kind of the situation that the country is in right now, right? We really have leaders that think that criminal activity is okay. And I'm glad to hear Chris Christie and Bill Barr speak up and say, this can't happen in this country. You know, we have rules. I've worked for the military for a very long time. There are rules about taking classified materials out of places. I understand that with senior leaders, um, you can have these situations where they get lost in a, a pile of papers. There are situations where people can carry them to different places, but they need to be controlled. I think in every case, if a secret document is found or a top secret document or, or on up, we'll have to make sure that they get returned immediately. It's reported immediately. And you understand the repercussions for those documents. Now, the whole issue with, with Trump is, it, and we'll go back to, to our international security situation, right? That we were talking about five minutes ago or two minutes ago. He took these out deliberately. He took boxes of documents out deliberately. They were not only top secret, they were higher classifications than that. And even if I took a top secret document out of any area that I had been reading one in, I would be probably, I would be in jail right now or, or prosecuted for life. I've made agreements. I've signed documents. You just cannot do that. On top of that, he is showing them to people who do not have clearance. They are not kept in a secure facility. He was asked to return them. When, and I'm not talking about one or two documents here. I'm talking about boxes of documents. He was asked to return them and refused to do so. These are very, very dangerous situations. You just do not do this. This is a national security emergency to have these kinds of documents at people's fingertips, particularly in Mar a Lago, where people go in and out of all the time. They know the former president works there. There was an incident. Was a year or several years ago where a woman from China got access just by deciding to walk in one day and she was arrested. So, I mean, this is not a joke. This is really serious stuff. And I think that all of our leadership, including the Republican members, need to speak out against this because this has to do with their national security as well. And again, it goes back to what keeps me up at night. We can't have leadership thinking it's okay for anyone to do this. You know, we all make mistakes, but we have to put us, you know, when it's intentional, it's just absolutely not. All right. Well, with that being said, let's move on to the next story. More Republicans are jumping into the 2024 race for the White House. Last week, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie announced his run, Christie, was a Republican governor in a blue state for eight years. He was also previously a candidate in 2016, where he ran against then-President Trump. For a time, he was an ally of Trump's, but recently he has been more critical of the former president. Mike Pence, the former vice president of the United States and running mate to Trump twice, is now running against Trump. Pence has has recently been more critical of Trump, criticizing him for his handling of January 6th and also criticizing him for his rhetoric. Also, Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, has announced that he will be running for the White House. It should be noted that Christie and Burgum's runs are both considered long shots. Pence is also considered a long shot. It should be noted Current polls right now have Pence in third place in the Republican primary. However, he is well behind Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor and the second place candidate currently in the polls for the Republican nomination, and even farther behind President Donald Trump, who holds a clear lead as of this moment in the polls for the Republican nomination. What are your thoughts on Pence, Burgum, and Christie announcing their candidacy, and how does this shift the race for the presidency and the contest for the Republican nomination? Well, I think, first of all, anybody close to January, January 6th and the insurrection shouldn't 
even consider running to office. I think we have to, you know, heal a bit as a nation and figure out that we're all Americans and we have to stand up for all Americans. You know, I think it's going to be interesting to see because I say, I think the Republican Party is still struggling. You know, they have this very right wing aspect and I think it's struggling to come where some come back and, and, and more of a, a middle ground and, you know, a work across the aisle kind of thing. And I think that's where you'll see Chris Christie candidacy come in but mike pence is part of this divisive society he was part of trump's vice president and i think that we really need somebody who's who's more understanding of the issues instead of the, the real future issues that we need to deal as as an american holistic society and in this world um you know, we have a war in Ukraine right now. I mean, all of those things, you know, we need leadership to be able to deal with this. And I think it's unfortunate, but what the GOP candidacy are doing is, you know, you're seeing them on these really, really extreme ends of talking about things that don't make people's lives better. Okay. They won't do anything about gun control. This whole abortion issue is a healthcare issue. We're banning books here in Florida, you know, and which I find as someone who lived in the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe to be framing since we fought the idea of the Cold War for such a long time. I was in Eastern Europe after the Soviet Union was dissolved and all this is what we fought against. So I think these candidates really need to think a little bit about how they're going to make life better. Otherwise, any of them, I think, are going to be long shots. And our end world is, we'll say extremism anytime. We'll have Trump from jail, which you know, I, try, I find scary as an American. And when I talk to people from, you know, different countries on the world, they're like, you guys can vote your president in. Why are you picking people who are not going to make your lives better and your communities and society better? So I think that's what we really need to think about. All right. With that being said, let's move on to the next story. So as more Republican candidates are getting in, one major prospective candidate has announced that he will not run. New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu announced this past week that he will not seek the Republican nomination. Sununu is currently in his fourth term as governor of New Hampshire. Sununu in the past has taken more moderate stances. He has identified as pro-choice in the past. Sununu announced that he would not run despite previously saying he was 60% certain he would run. Sununu declined to endorse a Republican candidate, but said he was against a Trump nomination again, saying that he believes Trump was responsible for the Republican underperformance in the 2022 midterm and that he was working to try and stop Trump from becoming the nominee once again. Trump went on to crash Sununu on his social media site, Truth Social, as a result. What are your thoughts on Chris Sununu announcing that he will not seek the presidency and not seek the Republican nomination for the presidency in 2024. Well, you know, we need the, the moderate candidates, so it's disappointing, but, you know, the field is just very chaotic right now. Everybody's jumping in. Everybody wants to throw their hat in the, the ring. And I think he totally made a better decision for himself and his family. You know, Donald Trump is a distraction. He is a, a distraction in this country from the real things that need to be done and the real things that we need to be thinking about. Again, climate change, our infrastructure, healthy, the pollutants. Look what happened with the, with the fires in Canada, the smog in New York and down to Washington, D.C. and some areas in Virginia. You know, people couldn't see. Okay, feet in front of them. And I mean, these are real issues that we need to be talking about. And and Donald Trump and his truth platform and his, you know, his divisiveness in this country is a distraction from not only us 
having a unified country, a unified country, which we need for national security, we need for our future, we need for economic stability, and to make people's lives better. And he is, he's a self-absorbed person who is only interested in his own vanity project, which is his platform, his jets, his stake, his vodka, whatever it is that has the Trump name all over it. So the, yeah. this, the vanity issue is, is just not good for society as well. All right. Well, with that being said, let's move on to the next story. Pat Robertson, the famous evangelist, has passed away. Robertson was most well known for his show, The 700 Club. He was a prominent conservative throughout the years. He did dabble a bit in politics. He did endorse certain Republican candidates. And in addition to that, in 1988, he was a major candidate for the Republican nomination for the presidency. He was one of the top candidates, along with then-Senator Bob Dole and then-Vice President George H.W. Bush. Despite this, Robertson ultimately lost the nomination to George H.W. Bush and decided not to run for any more political gigs. Robertson was 93 years old. What are your thoughts on the death of Pat Robertson? Truthfully, I really don't have any. I am an avid believer that church should stay out of state and politics. And he was an avid believer that we should become, it should be embedded in politics. Again, I'll go back to my own experiences. I've lived all different parts of the world. I've spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I know the Gulf nations very well. I, I've lived there as well. And I, I just don't think that religion and politics mix. And so I really think that there was a reason our forefathers said that in the Constitution, that they said church and state should be separated. So I'm sure Pat Robertson was a very nice guy, had a great family, but I cannot support the idea of having a one religion and, and it should not be even intersected with any part of, of my life. You are allowed to, in this country, worship as you will and as you may, and that's your personal choice and it's no one else's business. So I think it should be, be far away from that methodical thinking that we need to do to fix a lot of the, the issues that are on our plate today. And I'll leave it at. All right. Well, let's move on to the next story. So the United States Supreme Court recently made a surprise decision on U.S. redistricting maps. They determined that the Alabama maps that were redrawn in 2022 must be redrawn again. This is because they determined that the maps violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which says that states must draw their maps according to, they must draw districts according to racial population. The Supreme Court argued that Alabama failed to do that by not having at least two African-American majority districts so given the population of African-Americans throughout the state of Alabama. Currently, there is only one African-American majority district in Alabama. That's Terry Seawall's district. She's a Democrat. The Supreme Court has now determined Alabama must draw one more district. It should be noted that every liberal justice voted for this and two conservative justices voted for this as well. John Roberts, the chief justice of the Supreme Court, voted for this, as did Brett Kavanaugh. What are your thoughts on this ruling? I'm going to applaud the Supreme Court on this one. It's unfortunate that we have a Supreme Court now that that has a lot of controversy in it and they need to clean up their act a little bit. But I will applaud them on this. I think it sets an excellent precedent for states. You are supposed to be drawing lines according to population, not racial, racial issues or racial 
kind of perceptions or whatever. So I think it's all, it sends a good, it sends a good precedent because there's a lot of gerrymandering in both parties where they kind of like to draw their little lines to make sure that they win the next election. Both sides are, are, are guilty of this kind of gerrymandering. And I think that it's a good thing that the Supreme Court said, okay, this is enough is enough. You're supposed to draw these districts in a population centric way and not because you can win. It's called inclusive America again. And this is where really democracy is strong is at that local level. And people need to be able to exercise their democratic right within that context. All right. So let's move on to the next story. The Office of Special Counsel recently determined that White House Press Secretary Jean Pierre Curie violated the Hatch Act. The Hatch Act was named after former U.S. Senator Orrin Hatch and the limits the political activities of some federal employees. The office recently determined that Jean-Pierre violated the Hatch Act when she was at the podium and used the term, quote, mega MAGA Republicans. This was determined to have violated the Hatch Act. What are your thoughts on the Office of Special Counsel's determination on that? Well, I have to be honest, I really don't know what the context was of that particular usage of the word MAGA, but that's what the GOP has been using. So, right, you know, I don't, again, I'm, I'm not going to comment on something that I really haven't, I, have, I, I don't know the context behind. And I will say that they do call themselves that. So how could she have violated something that they refer to themselves as? I'll just leave it at that. All right. Well, that about wraps up our show. Uh, Patricia, thank you for joining me. Before you go, do you want to tell people where you can be found on social media? Yeah, I can be found on Twitter, Facebook, at Trisha's Take. You can find me there. It's pretty easy. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nolan Cleary, award-winning journalist and host of the hit podcast, Politics Weekly. I'm here to tell you about my new website, nolancleary.com. It's full of political analyses, a link to my podcast, and predictions for upcoming elections. If you want to know everything there is to know about upcoming elections, go to nolancleary.com right now. Hello and welcome to Presidential Profiles 2024. Today we will be discussing Ron DeSantis, a rising star in the Republican Party who hopes to be the nominee for president. DeSantis was born in 1978 in Jacksonville. DeSantis went to Catholic school and later attended Yale and Harvard. DeSantis joined the U.S. Navy in 2004 and became a lieutenant. DeSantis went on multiple tours to Afghanistan before running for office in 2012. He won the nomination for U.S. House in Florida's 6th Congressional District and beat Democrat Heather Beaven by 19 points. In Congress, DeSantis opposed gun control and the Affordable Care Act. After winning re-election, he ran for U.S. Senate in 2016 after the incumbent, Marco Rubio, retired to run for president. Eventually, Rubio ran for re-election, changing his mind and causing DeSantis to back out and run for re-election in his U.S. House seat. After winning again, DeSantis retired to run for governor of Florida. He faced Republican opposition from Adam Putnam, a heavy favorite for the nomination. However, after then-President Donald Trump endorsed DeSantis, he won the nomination handily. Trump and DeSantis remained friends for some time, with DeSantis running on his support for Trump. However, polls showed DeSantis trailing Andrew Gillum, the mayor of Tallahassee. DeSantis was accused of racism when he said we shouldn't monkey this up. Gillum was African American and many viewed that as a reference to a racial stereotype. Polls showed DeSantis would lose. In a surprise turn of events, he won, by a slim margin. DeSantis enjoyed broad support until 2020, when COVID-19 hit. Despite initially supporting a lockdown, DeSantis opened the state quickly, and opposed mask and vaccine mandates. 
This move was controversial, but put him on the map. DeSantis also supported a parental bill of rights, which was controversial to some, but further put DeSantis on the map for the White House. DeSantis got into a war with Disney over their opposition to the bill, with DeSantis taking away the company's special status, leading to a lawsuit. DeSantis faced former Governor Charlie Crist. DeSantis beat him by 19 points, the biggest margin of any Republican candidate for governor of Florida since 1872. Trump began to attack DeSantis as rumors began that he would run. DeSantis announced his candidacy via Twitter spaces. He is one of the leading candidates in the primary, but trailing Trump. Thank you for listening to Presidential Profiles 2024. Thank you for watching Presidential Profiles 2024. Listen to Politics Weekly every Tuesday wherever you listen to podcasts and subscribe to the nolancleary.com YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. Head to nolancleary.com to check out our website.